Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. You joined us during Nonprofit Power Week. We're talking all things about tech and predominantly AI with Jeff Hensel, one of the great leaders over with our friends at Ide Bailey. Now you might know Ide Bailey as a national um, accounting and finance tax audit, the gurus of all things um, when it comes to knowing the books but jeff comes to us as a tech leader and so this is the marriage of why we need to be thinking about tech not just for accounting and finance but really the management of our nonprofits. it's been a fascinating week so far today is day three and we're going to be talking about winning the tech game um, but before we do, let's go ahead and talk about the winners that we participate with every day. And those are our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by Miko Marquette Whitlock, the mindful techie. And... Um, he has brought a fascinating dimension. Nico, thank you for being with us this week. Well, thank you for having me. Excited to be here to continue the conversation. Yeah, it's really, really fun. Okay, now, yesterday, Jeff, when we launched the show um, in Sweden, they had just announced the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, it was just hours old. Um, this morning, they announced yet another prize and this is the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. But what is really interesting about it is it has a whole AI component. And so everybody is chipping away saying, OK, wait a minute. Who really is the winner? If AI was involved in this discovery, um, who owns it, right? Like, are the scientists involved in this or is AI? I think this conversation it, throughout the rest of the week is going to get hot and heavy. Yeah. Well, I'm, and thank you, Julia. I'm delighted to be back. And I agree. And I and I think from an AI perspective, at the end of the day, that's what you're going to see. It's going to become pervasive throughout. It doesn't matter if you're a chemist or a physicist or an accountant or, you know, somebody that uh, is doing their day to day job. It will become part of it over time. And I think the key is, is how do you adapt to that and, and adjust? Right. Well, let's talk about how you've adjusted because I Bailey, um, a nationally ranked um, powerhouse in the audit um, and accounting world, tax world. You have uh, representation and leadership throughout the country. You do a lot of different sectors. Um, we work with I Bailey, of course, because of the nonprofit sector. But you are not a CPA. How did you get into this gig? I, I'm not. And I had to, there was a secret handshake coming into I Bailey in order <laughs> to, I'm, I'm joking, but no, I, so I Bailey at the end of the day, we're a business advisory and uh, CPA accounting firm. And I think that's where, that's what really drew me to, to join I Bailey. I, I had spent 20 plus years at Microsoft Corporation before joining I Bailey. I left there specifically because I've, the opportunity to help uh, clients more holistically, meaning not just the compliance pieces and the things that we do that are really important around accounting and tax and audit and all of those other critical things that we do, but really the holistic view of where are they going? What's the business advisory? How do we bring that industry muscles, you know, for things like nonprofit to the table to, to drive uh, the big picture? It, it's really interesting because um, we mentioned this briefly yesterday, Jeff and Miko, that um, when you have clients that are more holistic in their approach, they're pro probably more successful and frankly, better clients. I can see why I Bailey has kind of maybe had to switch in the hubs a bit to get, you know, this type of leadership in. Um, so I think it's a fascinating piece of the organization and we are sure glad that you are here um, to help guide us through this conversation so when we're talking about getting started one of the comments you had to us was you know you need to get some quick wins what does that mean 
I, I think it, it means to me <clears throat> when we work with clients, at the end of the day, they see AI and the capabilities. They, they may have used Chad GBT or some other BARD or some other tool and they see the, the opportunity. And what we try to do is make sure that clients understand that this is a process. It's not, you know, the, the, the end isn't uh, at the beginning. So you have to think about where you start and you don't want to go too big in terms of your scope. And there's lots of reasons for that that I think we'll unpack over, over the time we have together today. But starting small and understanding a set of uh, organizational principles, processes, or things that you know you need help with that AI might be a good place to start. Things like content generation and um, you know whether it's in HR or, or the marketing or things like that, that's really where we see success is you start small, you have a finite timeline and then you build on that. Yeah, and I think building on that, you know, one of the things we know from culture change that you just bringing this lens to it is that the people are at the center of it. And so from a psychological um, perspective, um, it's actually healthy in terms of being able to support long-term change, right? If people actually can see and they can feel momentum as opposed to us simply having these conversations about something that might happen five years down the line, it's easier for people to sort of wrap their heads around something more tangible um, in the short term. And that creates momentum that helps you to sort of move through some of the tougher aspects of the change management you might be dealing with with some of these uh, technology implementations. For sure. And that's 100% true. And I, and I think that seeing those quick wins, seeing that short cycle improvement, or I see how now it makes sense for me to do uh, my, my role better uh, in some cases. In some cases, it might be, now I see it's actually not replacing my role. And we see that a lot. There's a lot of concern yeah. about AI replacing uh, human human jobs. And the, the truth, it couldn't be, I mean, you, it actually couldn't be further from the truth in terms of what the reality is. The reality is, is if you if you don't learn how to leverage AI and incorporate it into what you do, that's a bigger risk, frankly, than AI replacing you as a as a as a human being. Yeah, absolutely. I I think of it as sort of, you know, we have one additional tool in our toolkit, right? And it's a robust tool that we can use, and it's about how we use it. But that doesn't shift necessarily our shared mission or vision for the work that we're doing. That doesn't necessarily shift the impact that we're trying to have. It just gives us an ad additional pathway to achieving that impact. You know, Miko, I I'm fascinated with um, your comment about change management, centering this towards, you know, your team and, and the human side of this. Mm -hmm. Is this something because it's it's fraught with a lot of fear and it's something new? Would you recommend that we say, look, we're going to go after a quick win? we're going to get introduced to this like how did how much do you communicate to a team that is somewhat fearful or resistant to change i mean i i, I don't know that there's a one size fits all approach my okay. my take on this is you start with addressing whatever the concerns are head on right you know it's mm -hmm. it's a very real human thing and so I, my one of my things is oh, well let's let's talk about the fears right and let's talk about okay. what are perhaps the risks uh, what are the ways that perhaps um you know, this this might fail, it might not go right, right? And then, and then let's actually use it to have a conversation to talk about mitigation, right? So, okay, these are very real fears that we have about how this might not go well, or we had this experience in the past. Well, how can we learn from that? And how can we work with someone like Jeff to put together a plan that uh, that takes those into account? Um, and then Jeff and, and, you know, other folks can then say, okay, well, you know what? Why don't we actually start here? Why don't we actually go through this door and maybe start and chip away at this a little bit um, so that we can collectively see how this might work long term if we're building a relationship. I, I, I just want to continue to hammer that it's really about the people, right? And, and, you know, Jeff, I'm curious, like what your thought is in terms of working with working with the clients that so there are lots of advisors, there are lots of folks that are sort of really good at the technology piece, but the people piece is so critically important. So I wonder if you can sort of speak to this in terms of the relationship that you build with your clients so that you can build that trust that allows you to then work through some of these more challenging things that clients might be fearful of. 
And thank you for that, Miko. And I and I do think you know as many many folks watching this might be well. When are you going to talk about the te technology? When are you going to talk about what we can do? The, the real answer is you need to have these things in place first before you come up with any really amazing technology solutions. So for us, it's really about, to your point, people first. Cult and going back to our, our conversation yesterday about culture, because culture and people and leadership support and finding the right individuals in your organization who can help embrace it and train others that's where magic happens relative to an organization really adopting AI well. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that includes quick wins as well as the long-term strategy. And so there, there are a lot of really important things you have to frame with, uh, with clients that we work with. And it, just in terms of this isn't something you just, uh, you know, you plug in and it works. It's not an appliance. It's something you need to be thoughtful about. It's something you need to, probably train a little bit. It's something that needs to fit your organization and then work for the best of what you do, knowing that you have to have it secure, private, unbiased, all those other things. Yeah, absolutely. And it's an ongoing process. And I, you know, Jeff, I'm curious what your thoughts on this, but I, my experience is that uh, organizations and teams that do well with this type of technological change and disruption are teams that have a growth mindset, they embrace a continuous learning culture. And so the, the questions are less about the fear and um, sort of the apprehension and more about, oh, well, this is really interesting. I wonder how we can work with this. I wonder how we can embrace it. I wonder how we can leverage this if it's appropriate for our particular use case. I totally agree. And I, and I do think education of individuals is one of the most important things you can do. Educate them on what it is, why it's not scary, why uh, they need to be, but they still need to be thoughtful and mindful about how they use it. And then help them understand where some opportunities are. Because if you do that, then th the great ideas will come on, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do this? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could do that, right? And, and I think that's where you really start seeing uh, momentum and finding the right individuals in your organization to do that is where, uh, where you really see traction starting to happen within or organizations. Yeah. So I'm fascinated and you're talking, Jeff, about really laying some foundation, foundational work that um, it's not like plugging in a toaster and all of a sudden you're good to go. I think that's something that is a really important thing to um, factor in. It, it is. And, and, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about specific applications tomorrow. Uh, and But one of the examples I would give is chatbots. They're amazing when they work. <laughs> They're not amazing when they don't work. And what happens for chatbots is if it doesn't work the first time, you'll never use it again yeah. because your memory will be the first time you used it, you asked it four questions that were pretty specific and it didn't answer your question. And so to that point, I do think that's one of the lowest bars for organizations to start with AI. The challenge is you can only, it only knows so much when you plug it in. And then you have work to do to make sure it's answering the questions you want to answer the way you want them answered so that a human doesn't have to answer the phone or answer an email or have a hallway conversation like they do today. Mm -hmm. So how do we develop a sense of what the best practices are? Because as Nico mentioned at the top of this episode, these things are changing so quickly and how if we haven't worked on in this this arena you don't know what you don't know like how do we determine what these best practices are going to be or should we understand that it's going to be a moving target i i do think it will i mean it's it, it i think there are principles that you need to use and we've covered a, a number of them this week you know just understanding your IT infrastructure, your security layer, your data, how are you going to use it? How do you get started in terms of quick wins and, and moving forward? And then on the people side, which, you know, to Miko's point is so important, 
make sure you have leadership buy-in. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then have that com that difficult conversation before you start. Mm -hmm. And then how do you find the right, what I call points of light in your organization to help support that initiative going forward? And so if you can do those two things, do the foundational things around technology, understand your culture, uh, pick a pick a handful of wins and to get started or a num just start somewhere with one quick win and then build on that. That's really the framework for success. Absolutely. And I, you know, one additional thing that I would add to that, Jeff, is to really think about mindset in terms of viewing this as sort of a long term thing. Like this is not uh, a sprint. It's a it's a, it's really a, a marathon. And so really asking yourself, are you able to commit to a long term relationship with whatever this approach or whatever this tool is? Because it's not simply a matter to your point of plugging it in or or training it and then sort of setting it and forgetting it. It's a it's it's sort of like if someone gives you a a, a free puppy, you still have to feed the puppy, you still have to walk the puppy, you still have to like take it to the vet. Right. And so it's. <laughs> I, I, you just used my favorite analogy on the open source back in the day, free like a puppy. I love it. Well, Nico, how do you, when you're talking about people first and you're talking about, you know, rolling out something that is a growing, changing cultural thing, how do you keep everybody rowing in the same direction and and keeping them up when they feel like they're frustrated or it's not going to work or it's too hard or they're, they're fearful. Like, what are some of the things that you can do to help bring people along? I I go back to just share what is our shared vision, right? And okay. what is the impact that we're trying to have? And you want to center that at the start of the process, right? So people understand that this tool that we're using or this this technology transformation that we're about to undergo is supporting us in, in doing that. And there might be many more tools or many more transformations that we add to this to help us to achieve this goal. And as you're moving along uh, with the, with the specific implementation, reminding folks along the way, you know, when you have those hiccups, when you have those roadblocks, okay, well, we're, we're going this way. And, you know, just reminding folks uh, uh, along the way, part of that is something that you do is just as part of just like very good project management, right? You have the regular check-ins, you're, you're, you're processing, you know how things are going at each stage of the process you're reflecting backwards and you're, re you're reflecting forward um and you you know as a good project manager you're also mm -hmm. reminding people about okay well here is keeping our eye on the ball here's here's the vision that we are agreeing to here's mm -hmm. what we're what we're focused on and mm -hmm. making that a part of the process as opposed to oh well, we're just going to do this at the one time thing. we're going to have one kickoff meeting and sort of level set and that's going to be the the end of the discussion we're just going to move head first into the change so it has to be an ongoing conversation um that we're having as you know going back to the puppy uh analogy <laughs> as that puppy is growing right and becoming more and more embedded as part of your team a part of your family uh, you know you you continue to have conversations about what what is the need what are the needs as you and the team continue to grow and how do you adjust your approach or whatever the tool is that you're using or set of tools you're using um, to meet whatever those needs are. Jeff, are you, um, it, it seems to me like when you're leading this conversation, this change, you become a little bit of a counselor first because you're dealing with people and then you're moving to the tech side. How do you see that? Or what, what's been your experience with this? Well, one of the things I would say, and so to Miko, to your point, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, over communication, finding those individuals that will help drive it is critical. I think on the, you know, from an I Bailey perspective, our advisory services are just that we're, we're advising clients based on the breadth of knowledge that we have across an industry or depth around a technology. And, and frankly, it's all of the above with I Bailey because we do all of those things and we have resources that we can bring to bear across an entire organization. And so what we do is we start with what, you know, be, begin with the end in mind uh, if you're a Covey fan. And so think about where you want to go and then bring it back to how do you start? 
And that's where the quick wins come in and then really understanding and validating whether that's working or not and adjusting as necessary. It's such an interesting thing. And, and it leads me to how do we know when we're moving forward with the right amount of time, the right amount of investment and our, and our planning. And so how do we measure this? How do we go back to, especially our boards and saying, yeah, this has been tough, but look at what we're, we're doing. And how does this, how does the, how does this all work out and how do we communicate these things? Well, I'm going to use your, uh, one of the favorite uh, consultant, uh, answers, which is it depends. It depends. Okay. So, and so it depends on what your goals and objectives are and how you've defined those. And so those goals and objectives that you have as an organization, that should dictate how you start and what you might measure. Because if it's not moving towards that goal, then it's maybe not the right thing to do. And so that's why the and the guidance around that context is so important for clients is you need to get value out of this. It's there is a cost to implementing AI and you need to make sure it furthers your vision and goals and objectives for your organization. And you need to be able to measure it And the measurement. You know, organizations have measures today. They know when they're successful or not. Nonprofits, you know, there, there are loads of metrics that are specific to that industry, just like there are manufacturing or financial services or any other industry. So understanding where you might want to move the needle and marrying that to starting on your AI journey, I think is really the key. And then having in your back pocket, we're going to start here. And this is what incremental improvement looks like. Here's what really good improvement looks like. And here's how we know we're failing and then time bound that so that you uh, that you make sure you're measuring it and reporting on it. And then the last thing I'd add is for individuals who are expected to use the AI or the tool, you have to have a way to get them trained, educated and um, feel confident in using it because that's really going to be the key indicator. You know, if the metrics aren't working and nobody's using it, then there's a reason. Yeah. And I, I would share one approach as, you know, someone who's like managed large scale projects in federal government and also a nonprofit in terms of technology change. One of the ways that I approach it that I found very helpful is with the different phases of a project. Um, sometimes we, we, we lump in discovery as part of like a longer project. M my preference is really to take out the discovery and have that as a separate project that you focus on first and then have that let you lead into the transformation or the, or the technology implementation. And what that does is it allows you to have a deep dive and exploration that's simply focused on what Jeff just mentioned in terms of, well, what are our goals or objectives and how are we gonna measure this? And what are, what are the data that we do have and how is this gonna impact the organization? And do we have the right people to help us inside the organization? And, and what are the fears and doubts that we have and how can we work through those? Um, sometimes taking the pressure of the immediate need for or, or excitement to sort of dive into the, the tech or the tool first, taking that off the table and really just, you know what, let's just have a project where we're just sort of focused on working with the consultant on working out all these kinks, getting a solid plan in place, answering all these questions, talking maybe to other folks who have gone through this process, like really doing an exhaustive dive on that. And that really gives you a firmer foundation to go into a sort of a more durable tech transformation inside your organization. Yeah. What do you think about that, Jeff? Yeah. I 100% agree. And I think that's what we're seeing that very frequently, especially with emerging technology, Miko, is understanding what the scope is. Uh, making sure you kind of go through the what if analysis on things that may or may not go wrong, understanding how you measure it and doing that as a project before the project, because what it, that really, that does two things for us. It shortens the cycle time to success. So it shortens how quickly you can see results and understand whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the other thing it does is it just allows people to 
understand the scope and, and, and get their heads wrapped around what it is and, and how it's going to help them. Uh, and for projects that we, where we do that, we see them much more on time, on budget, and um, then we move on from there. Absolutely. And it's a, it can be on the front end a bigger sort of investment, but to your point, Jeff, it actually saves you time. And one of the ways that it can save you time is sometimes what I see is organizations will pick a tool before they have done the discovery process. And yeah. if you do the discovery process first, you you may find that the tool that you're or the solution that you're focused on might not be the solution that yeah. you need right not every problem is a nail exactly. so you might need something other than a hammer for sure exactly i love it i think it's really um nico i, I love that you framed that back also i see the value and how that works with when you you keep saying people first you know, depending on what your team looks like and what their mindset is. And as I Bailey taught me many years ago, that phrase tone at the top, how does your leadership, you know, filter down um, their engagement and their leadership throughout this type of change? Um, it's really important to start with this with this task. Um, but I've got to imagine and we don't have a lot of time left. I got to imagine that there are a lot of organizations that are like, no way, we don't have time for that. We got to go. We got to jump in. We're behind. How do you mitigate that when somebody says we don't need to, to do oh, the discovery boy. part? Yeah, I haven't thought about that, but Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I for me, it's pay me now or pay me later, not me mm -hmm. personally. But you have to at some point you have to do this work. Mm -hmm. And so you can either choose to do it when it's way more urgent and you're behind or you can choose to invest the time to do it as part of your you know rhythm of business the muscle that i think a lot of organizations fail to build over time is that long-term view and then incorporating that transformational muscle as part of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis the world changes every day and organizations need to think about that it's not just business as usual or running the organization as usual that's not you can't do it that way and so getting ahead of that and we see this all the time in technology but that's that's what to me we see a lot of clients that still say we're not doing it i just don't have the budget and that's fine but it's not about budget in this case it's about thinking about the future not necessarily acting on the future mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you, Jeff. I think you're you're going to spend the time, the energy, the resources either way. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, do you want to do it a bit more efficiently, perhaps save some on the back end? And I, I think of it akin to you know, if, if you're practicing good medicine, you know, you call the doctor and say, hey, like I'm having this ache and pain. Can you prescribe me something? A good doctor is going to say, actually, we need you to come in. Let's do an, let's do an assessment. Right. Let's mm -hmm. let's actually. Let's, let's go through the, the vitals. Let's go through your chart. Let's, let's rule out some other things. And let's make sure that what I'm prescribing you is actually the, the right thing first. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about let's, let's do the full checkup first. And let's make sure that we're actually you know, diagnosing the right problem. And we can prescribe the right solution for you based on what you need. Yeah. I love that. Pardon me. You choked me up there, Miko. I, I think that's great. Well, this has been part of a really interesting conversation, Nonprofit Power Week with Ide Bailey. We started off with just what is generative AI and why should nonprofits be needing needing this tool and how should we thinking about how should we be thinking about it, how we should be preparing for it. Today we talked about how we win and how do we get our teams on board. Uh, because if we don't have our team rowing in the same direction, we got a whole other load of problems to deal with. We're going to be talking about getting started, like what are some specifics? Um, and we'll be dealing with that tomorrow. And then on Friday, we're going to be doing um, ask and answer questions that have come in, questions that we've had. And um, we'll get Jeff in the hot seat and, and really, you know, look at some specific things. So it'll go very quickly. And there's a, a a robust number of questions to deal with. Um, really been interesting. Jeff, it's been fun to learn from you. And uh, Miko Marquette Whitlock, just amazing. Um, really a huge conversation that even though we've dedicated a week to this, I feel like we need weeks 
for this. <laughs> and again, as we've all identified, this is a changing topic. So um, this is not a one and done situation. We also want to make sure that we express our gratitude to our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that allow us to have these amazing conversations. And this week, like we've had with Ide Bailey. So join us back tomorrow, or if you've missed any of the previous shows, you can uh, access our archives and uh, really get caught up and, and hopefully help your organization to navigate this exciting time of change. All right, as we end each and every episode, we'd like to remind everybody of this mantra that we use. It means different things each day. And today it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. See you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thank you.